Cool. Okay. Um, thanks, Joe. Uh, so today I'll be sharing the research we've done testing different devices, research tools, and web browsers, so we could get an idea of what kind of timing errors we could expect from running research online. Uh, so we ran our study so that researchers could get an idea of non-participant noise in online experiments, in other words, timing. Uh, the short answer to this question here, so how good is timing in online experiments, is that timing for the vast majority of researchers is good enough on all main computers, browsers, and platforms. It's when you need accuracy and precision under 100 milliseconds uh, that what I'll cover today starts to matter. Okay. So the first thing we should consider um, when we're looking at this is where does our measurement noise come from, uh, which timing inaccuracy contributes to um, when we're running online studies. Uh, so we can split this into two sources. So the first is your participant. Uh, so they might have some kind of malingering or inattention. Um, instead of engaging in our task, they could be intentionally trying to get through it as quickly as possible, um, or it could be a case of motivation or boredom. Um, you also have very little control over their environment. Um, so this could be where they are, what's happening around them. Um, when you're running stuff online, they can literally be anywhere on a train station or, or whatever. So this can also contribute to a noisier measurement than you would expect from the lab. Uh, this first aspect can be solved uh, using an improved experimental design uh, to increase engagement and recognizing that you're running research online rather than in the lab. Um, so this can be the, characterize this as the carrot, if you will, um, or you can use participant selection for engaged users or tests of attention before the main task where people who fail those tests um, don't progress on to, to your measure of interest. And so you could characterize this as the stick. Uh, the second source of measurement noise is the tools that you're using. Uh, and this is the focus of this talk, uh, the device your participant has. Uh, so this could be a Windows, ancient Windows 2000s device or a top of the range gaming PC, you really don't know. Uh, the browser that they're using is going to make a difference. These are all developed with different aims in mind from a behavioral researcher. So they're focusing on usability, speed, and flexibility, which might not align with our um, desire to get good, accurate data. Um, you can also have a choice over the software that you use for displaying your experiment. This is going to change the noise. Uh, the software libraries available use different techniques for rendering and response time logging. Um, and a second aspect can be improved by restricting the type of device and browsers that you allow people to run on your web study. Uh, so this is something that Gorilla actually has a, a, a GUI option for. Um, and the other thing that you can do is choose software based on your, your specific requirements, and that can have an impact on the noise. Um, but in order to make any informed decision about these restrictions in the second factor, um, or even if you actually need to do them, um, as I said, if you're not interested in precision and accuracy under 100 milliseconds, it doesn't matter so much. Um, but in order to make those decisions, we need to have some data on all, all the, how all of these aspects start to affect measurement noise. Um, uh, one thing that's helpful to characterize, so when we're looking at assessing timing, um, is the difference between accuracy and precision. Um, so the accuracy of a set of measurements is the uh, centering of a mean in a desired location. Uh, so this, in this case, it would be the distance from the bullseye that the mean of all of these like bullet holes would be getting. Um, in timing, it's as close to zero lag as possible, uh, whereas precision is the spread of these measurements um, or, the, or the variance, the standard deviation, or what, what, however you choose to characterize it. Um, in the lab with specialist software and equipment, you can get this kind of bottom right situation where you have good accuracy and precision. Um, but on online, that, that is less possible. Um, but if we get high enough precision, um, for most designs, this will be good enough. Um, so I'll go into this later, um, but just keep this in mind when, when I'm looking at showing the results. Okay, so first I'll go over a bit about our study. Um, so for our timing study, we wanted to give researchers information that they need to understand the noise that would be provided by participants set up. Uh, so for this reason, we tested four computers, um, four different browsers, um, and four different web platforms for, for building experiments. Um, combining all of these factors created a very large number of combinations that we had to test. Um, and so this took a very long time. 
um, and this differs from previous research and therefore builds on the literature um, in that we didn't make many modifications to these devices here. Um, so we didn't use a button box or any high precision hardware, or we just took the devices as they were. Um, so the, the noise that we report is the noise that you are likely to see in some of your participants. Okay. Um, so for those of you that don't know much about external chronometry, which is how you test the timing performance of your experimental setups, uh, this is potentially boring, but I'll talk about how, how you do this. Uh, so we used two tests. Uh, we used a visual display duration test, uh, which looked at how accurate the device browser software combination was at presenting a white square for a given duration of frames. Uh, this task consisted of a preceding black screen for half a second, which is about 30 frames at 60 hertz, uh, which is the vast majority of users' refresh rates of their monitors, um, and then a white frame after this black frame for a variable duration. Um, a photo diode um, was attached to the screen, so we used the black box toolkit, um, and this detects the onset and offset of that white square with millisecond level accuracy. Um, it was connected to an external computer, which was independent of the computer that we set up that we were testing. Um, and this means that we're going to get as accurate as an independent as possible idea of the display timing. Um, for this test, we only tested using Windows and Mac OS uh, because we didn't think that we needed to test more because we weren't using a keyboard or anything like that. And that was the key difference between our devices. Um, okay, the second test that we did was a reaction time assessment. Uh, so the design of the assessment was similar. And so we had this kind of black frame for half a second and then a white frame, except this time it was displayed until a key was passed on the keyboard. So this is just the space bar. Uh, the photodiode again was detecting this white screen. Uh, so when that came up, um, it triggered this thing here, which is a robotic finger. Um, it triggered this to press a key and we could set the key presses for a specific reaction time. Um, and then the task would continue for another trial. Okay. So jumping straight into the results. Uh, so these were the mean results of the duration test for the display accuracy. Um, so these, these means don't actually show the different requested durations of that white square. Uh, the results are split up by browser over here, um, an operating system here. Um, and on the y-axis, we have the um, different platforms. And on the x-axis, we have the latency of the delay. Or, or the delay itself. Um, and this red dotted line here at zero uh, represents where we really want to be. Um, so this is we requested the white square to be displayed for a certain amount of time, and it was displayed exactly for that amount of time. Um, so coming back to this concept of accuracy and precision, I put this bullseye up here again. Um, so the width of these lines here, um, which represents the standard deviation, um, is the precision of our measurements, so the spread of these dots. Um, and the distance of this dot here, which is the mean, uh, represents the accuracy. So you kind of want this as close as possible. Um, but when we're looking at differences between conditions, which is what most people are looking at when they're doing behavioral testing, um, the precision thing is the most important metric because when you subtract conditions together, the accuracy is the same across conditions. Um, it's precision that then adds noise in that situation. Um, so looking at this, one of the standout things here is that there's not really a coherent story for any given platform or operating system. Things all seem to depend on a unique combination of those factors. Uh, so some of these conditions are less good. So like JS Psych on Mac OS has a lot of variance. Um, but when you look at JS Psych on Chrome on Windows, um, it's actually pretty good. So the, the standard deviation overlaps with zero. Um, uh, when you look at um, PsychoJS, which is the um, PsychoPy's JavaScript implementation um, on Mac, it's pretty close to zero on all of these situations, but it achieves this by sometimes underrepresenting frames. Um, so, in an instance where you wanted really short stimuli, like in a masking experiment, uh, you might present a frame um, and it wouldn't be displayed at all um, in that situation. Uh, so, again, it's a complex story. I think one of the take home messages when looking at this data um, is that Chrome is generally a good browser for timing. Um, Chrome on Windows is the best combination. So if you were just gonna restrict those things for timing, that's the one that you would use. Um, one of the cool things we could do with our assessment um, is we could look at the potential sources of this imprecision. 
um, as a function of the display duration requested. So we have these traces here. Um, so these are the number of frames we asked, and these are, this is the delay across those frames for each of those um, browser combinations. And you can see that like in certain durations, you get these dips or like increases um, in the delay. Um, so basically this is saying that in some situations, um, for some browsers, uh, this unique combination of how, how much time you're requesting something to be displayed for um, and what browser it's being used might lead to different imprecisions. If you don't test these things at different frame durations, um, you're unlikely to be able to see this. So this is going to artificially decrease the precision that you're seeing. Okay, um, so moving to reaction time. Uh, so we have some more graphs here. Um, I wish I could go through all of these, but I don't have enough time in the, the presentation. Um, but again, um, when we're looking at these concepts of accuracy and precision, in a lot of places here, you can see it, the precision is really, really good. So you've got these tight lines. And other situations, not so much. Um, again, we've got a complex story where it's not as simple as like one browser or one, one, one platform being, being very good. But again, if you look at Windows Chrome, you have this really good kind of like more tight, um, tight precision that we're getting here. Um, so again, a take home message, maybe use that combination if you're really concerned about timing. Um, the difference between laptops and desktops on the same oper operating system illustrates um, the contribution of keyboard noise. Um, so with Gorilla on Chrome on the Mac OS desktop, it was really good. Um, and then it was less good uh, using the laptop. And that's probably down to the keyboard, which unfortunately we don't have any control over. It's just making you think about the type of variants that your user's devices are going to be introducing. Um, one thing that didn't make a difference, unlike with display duration, is the reaction time delay. Um, it didn't matter if the reaction time um, key presser was programmed for 100 milliseconds or 500 milliseconds. It had no impact on its logging, which is great as a researcher. It means people with fast reaction times are logged just as accurately as people with slow reaction times, which is great. Um, so one last thing to contextualize with these results. Uh, we ran a participant logging analysis uh, of logs of users from the website, so over 200,000 people. Uh, this is likely to represent practices of guerrilla researchers, but the sample is big enough to assume some representativeness of the general internet research pool. Uh, the first thing that we looked at were browser and operating systems that people use. So 22% of people using computers. Of people who were using computers, 74% of those were Windows and 22% were Macs. 96% of our users uh, were using the devices that we test in our timing tests. If we look at the breakdown, rather encouragingly, the biggest percentage of people were using Chrome on Windows. Um, so it means you're most likely to get something that is a good timing, uh, that, that provides good timing. Okay, um, so that's the end of my talk. I'll just go through some conclusions. Um, thanks for listening. Um, firstly, our results compared to other current papers showed a greater delay than reported. I believe this is because devices add a non-trivial amount of variability, especially those um, when we're comparing with reaction times to button boxes. Uh, this is something to consider as most participants will have worse computers than you think they might have. Second, that despite this timing is really good, um, low variability, which is important, so precision is, is, is also good. Um, but us and others would suggest that you use within subject designs to decrease the source of um, kind of like uh, noise from your participant setups. Um, if you do restrict participants because you care about timing, use Chrome or Windows. But if you really, really care, um, I, would, I would carry out your own tests and get your own kind of um, chrono chronometry. Um, and then based on those results, restrict. Um, restrict the, the browsers and computers that your um, participants are able to use. Okay, thank you. The preprints on SAR archive, and um, that is the end of my talk. Cool. All right, thanks, Alex. Great, great talk. I, I was actually, I'm so delighted to see that the preprints on Psych Archive, because, um, you know, as you said, the complexity of those data sets suggests that it's really worth looking at them when you're trying to plan your own experiment. Um, yeah. And I was thinking about that with respect to some of our earlier speakers, you know, particularly people who are going into schools, you know, where their 
they are doing things across between subjects because of age differences and all the rest. And yeah. um, knowing in advance, you know, like what hardware they have, they can potentially choose uh, choose timing paradigms for their experiments, but also, you know, browsers and whatnot to try to optimize. Yeah. How, um, how long did this take? Because this looks like a total labor of love. Um, that was, um, yeah, it took a lot of time. I think in total, there was like 220,000 different trials that we had to to test if we concatenated all the conditions. Uh, so I, I worked a gorilla part time. So it took about six months of like programming a button to go like this constantly. Oh yeah, it took a while. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's just enormously valuable data, and it's so nice to see that kind of information because it's exactly the thing that a lot of us worry about. So actually having the paper to say, look, here it is, spelled out with great data sets. In, yeah. immensely valuable thank you so much for that really appreciate it cool. thanks i'm just going to say thank you again to, to alex irvine